was absolutely able to capture exactly what I want, the vulnerability, the, the um, insecurities, the, the feelings that she was not capable of being whom they wanted her to be. Uh, and she was wonderful. Vous avez déjà causé beaucoup d'ennuis, Monsieur Donovan. À côté de vous, je suis un enfant de cœur, Madame. Enfin, Madame, si l'on peut dire. Vos ennuis seront bientôt terminés. For the role of um, uh, of Diana, uh, I looked. I, I knew what I wanted. I wanted a compelling presence. Again, if you look at the miniseries carefully, she doesn't have very much to say in the whole piece, but she is a domineering dominatrix. <laughs> uh, she is a presence that um, that is is frightening, is compelling, is incredibly sexy and seductive, uh, is probably bisexual. And uh, so there was a lot of intriguing levels to play, and I read a lot of women, and, and many of them came in and sort of read it as though they were doing a melodrama, you know, and I said, no, 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 no. And, uh, and I looked and looked, and we were, I think, uh, three or four weeks into the filming. Uh, I finished shooting one day, and I came back to the studio that night, and they said, we think we found somebody for you. Um, and uh, Phyllis Huffman was the uh, head of casting and Mindy Marin, and they said, go in and, and talk to this lady and see what you think. And I walked into the room, and, and Jane was sitting somewhere, and she turned around, and there were these brown eyes the size of dinner plates, you know, and this countenance and this, you know, good evening. <laughs> you know, and I went, okay, you got the part, Janie, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Finding the guy to play Mike Donovan proved to be a real problem because um, we, we didn't want a big star in the role, partly because uh, it was an ensemble piece. V from the beginning uh, was an ensemble. It was a group of people. It was like the, the movie Crash that recently was out, uh, where you focused on a number of different players. Uh, and indeed, the, the credits were all listed alphabetically. And so there were a number of actors that wouldn't even talk to us because unless they had top billing, they wouldn't appear. Mark was the last person that uh, that we met. It was Friday before we started filming on Monday. I did not have a leading guy yet, and he was scheduled to work on Monday. And Mark came in, and, uh, uh, and he and I read together, because I always read with the actors myself. Um, and, uh, and he just knocked everybody's socks off. And, uh, uh, and, and he said, oh, I said, okay, that's great, you're in. Uh, tomorrow morning, at Saturday, we're going to rehearse for, we got two, two days of rehearsal at the American Film Institute, and uh, come up and let's read the, the picture together. And, uh, and he said, wow! <laughs> you know, and it proved to be just the perfect choice. The small role of, of Willie, the sympathetic visitor, uh, they brought me this mousy little guy named Robert England long before he became a not mousy Freddy Krueger. <laughs> And, uh, and Robert has told me um, uh, many times how, of all the work that he's done, that's the piece that people come to and talk to him about. Je t'assure qu'on devrait quitter la ville. Les routes sont bouchées, tu vois bien. Oh, ça l'est. Tu as entendu ce qu'a dit le président. Pour l'instant, ils n'ont pas les rostiles. Mais s'ils le sont. Mais s'ils le sont, je ne suis pas sûr qu'on trouverait facilement un endroit où on pourrait se cacher. One of the best days I ever had in my life as a, as a director in, in this business was the day I saw my rough cut of V. Now, the rough cut is when the editors have put it all together for the first time. And, and you're sitting there as a director, usually with your hand over your face, going, oh my god, is that what I did? <laughs> you know, and I have to fix it, but I don't know if I can. But the, watching the rough cut of V was an extraordinary experience, because uh, at that time, we had not had time to do any of the visual effects, any of the matte paintings, any of the motion control with the spaceships, any of the laser stuff and all of that. None of that stuff was there. It was just the actors working. And it will work like a million bucks. <laughs> it was fabulous because all of the actors had come, uh, come to me with performances that were just pitch perfect. There was not a weak link in the entire cast. And given how quickly we had had to throw the cast together, it's amazing, you know, because, you know, you don't always end up with the best, even though you think you have.
In this case, I did. There's not a weak performance in the whole piece. And I sat there in that screening room just giggling to myself, saying, oh my God, when we add all of the other stuff, all of the sci-fi stuff, uh, this is going to be a piece that will work not only on a, on, a, on a commercial popular level, but once the audience is there, we're going to really grab them emotionally. And um, it's funny because I called Brandon Tartikoff as soon as I had seen it, and I said, Brandon, I think you're really going to be happy. Uh, it really comes together. It's going to work great when we add all the bells and whistles and the big symphonic score inspired by Beethoven that I had planned, which I'll tell you about. Um, uh, I said, this is going to be really something. I said, there is a problem. And he said, what's the problem? And I said, it's not four hours. And he said, well, how long is it? He said, it's four hours and 15 minutes. And he said, well, we'll just trim it down. I said, I don't know where to cut it. I said, this is not Kenny protecting his golden words. I said, I really don't know what to cut that won't damage the picture by its removal. And I said, will you come and look at it and give me a fresh pair of eyes and tell me what you think? He said, you bet, you know. So he came the next day and he screened it and he walked out of the screening room sort of shaking his head. And I said, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> what's he going to say? And he said, he said, I've got to go to the affiliate stations and get 15 more minutes. And I said, can you do that? And he said, I don't know, <laughs> but I'm going to try. And, um, and that's what he did. He went to the, uh, all the affiliates around the country, some 200 and something of them, and said, we really want V to play out at its full length and, uh, and, you know, and eat into your news, 11 o'clock news. You know? and, uh, and the affiliates went along with it. And the first night of V ran from 9 until 11.15. Unheard of. It was unheard of. It was unprecedented. It had never been done. And, you know, people, you know, 11 o'clock came and then 11.05 and people were checking their watches going, wait a minute, how long is this thing? <laughs> you know? And, um, uh, but Brandon, bless his heart, from the beginning had caught the vision that I had and was willing to, um, to ride with it and to put himself on the line for it. The music for V is, is interesting. Joe Harnell, uh, the composer who did the score for me, uh, I had met years earlier working in television together. He had done, I had brought him in to do The Bionic Woman with me. He had created the themes for The Incredible Hulk, uh, that iconic lonely man theme that people hear and immediately takes them to that sad Bixby hitchhiking shot, you know, that we would end with. Uh, the music was truly iconic. And so Joe was my natural go-to guy uh, to do the score for V. And and I got him involved right from the beginning. Um, uh, he read the script as soon as everybody else read it uh, at the beginning. And uh, he made a, a couple of interesting comments to me. He said, you know, Kenny, the piece is about how they have come to steal our water. He said, but I, I miss moments of water in the course of the movie. And I said, oh, my God, you're right, Joe. And so I uh, began finding ways to in to plug water in when the when the two teenagers are are, are sitting uh, after the first day when they they first arrived and she's saying I don't want to die a virgin and all of that. If you look carefully at the scene, the sprinklers are on and lawn behind them. You know, there are scenes around swimming pools. There's even a scene where David Packer, uh, playing the young Hitler youth, gets thrown into a swimming pool uh, where people are dipping into water. Where uh, you know, so that I, water sort of runs as a light motor through the whole piece. Um, there's a wonderful scene between uh, um, Blair Tefkin, the teenager, and David Packer uh, at night with the rain outside the window where the shadows of the rain is running down. You see the, the shadows on their face. Um, and it, it allowed me to sort of keep that, uh, that element, literally that element, involved uh, in the story. And, uh, uh, and it was because of Joe, because Joe mentioned that. I also told Joe Harnell, my composer, uh, something that he hadn't been aware of, and that was that whenever the BBC was going to send messages to the resistance during World War II via the BBC on the radio, they would play the first four notes of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Ba 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 ba. And I said, "Do you know why, Joe?" And he said, "He said he remembered it. He was an old guy. He was there with the Glenn Miller Orchestra, <laughs> you know, as a kid." And I said, "It's because." dot, 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 dash is Morse code for the letter V.